good afternoon let me continue my session in the previous uh, session we have looked into chapter 1 contains now we will look into chapter 2 contains now chapter 2 basically discusses about uh, programming and uh, the programming dependencies right so in this chapter again this is chapter number 2 from your prescribed textbook kai hong right so in this chapter you are going to learn about four things so it is going to be chapter number to textbook one right now looking at the outcomes of this uh, chapter the first thing that you're going to look is conditions of you're going to look into the conditions of parallelism once when you look into the conditions of parallelism the second thing is going to look into the problems pertaining to partitioning and scheduling problems regarding partitioning and scheduling problems regarding partitioning and scheduling the third one you are going to look into program flow mechanism program flow mechanism and the program flow mechanism the last one very important when you are going to look into system interconnection you are going to look into system interconnection architectures right so these are the four uh, things that we are going to learn from here chapter number two conditions of parallelism problem problems regarding partitioning and scheduling then you want to look into program flow mechanism and then you're going to look into system interconnection architecture right all these four things the first one is in what way you can enhance the computation the one way we can enhance computation is using parallelism now what are the various conditions in which parallelism can be exploited are going to be looked in detail here once when you are through with uh, the mechanism wherein you can use parallelism then you are going to look looking into partitioning and then scheduling because in parallel computing more than one processor will be working then how we are going to schedule in what way you are going to split and then schedule is going to be looked in detail once when you have partitioned and scheduling then always there should be a particular flow mechanism to be defined in what way should your data flow occur the control flow should occur is going to be defined here and then the last one system interconnection architecture in what way you are able to make different systems to connect together because when we talked about parallel computers the interaction between two computers was through message parsing technique right now what is the mechanism that is used for interconnecting this systems together is what we are going to study in detail in the interconnection architectures because uh, in this inter interconnection architecture you might have come across uh, various uh, topologies now all those we are going to study in detail with respect to with respect to condition so these are the four things that we are going to discuss in chapter two this is the second part of your module one clear right now we will go in detail into the first one the conditions of parallelism we look into the conditions of parallelism right now the question arises why do we need to look for parallelism the answer is very simple because we want to enhance the enhance the performance or reduce the computation time right now for this when you look into the theoretical aspects of how a parallel computation can be done earlier it used to be a sequential execution in case of a sequential execution it used to be one after another but somewhere somewhere some approaches should be changed from the sequential to the parallel execution so that is where uh, a paper was published on this and that paper talks about three things it talks about three things for exploiting the parallelism it talks about three things for exploiting the parallelism right so i said no it looks into 
three conditions are being discussed in, in a theoretical approach for uh, how a parallelism can be achieved. So, the three theoretical approaches have been uh, discussed. Three key aspects are uh, being uh, enlisted for achieving parallelism. In that, the first one is going to be defining a computational model. Computational model for again you the first thing is you need to define a computational model the second thing that 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 paper discusses it talks about interprocess communication interprocess communication right the second point that it discusses it talks about interprocess communication and then the third one it takes is system integration So these are the three things that the paper discusses, right? Now it first looks into the computation models, then it looks into interprocess communication, and then it looks for, it looks into system integration for a, for incorporating parallelism, right? Now if you are able to address these key issues, key aspects, then automatically you can move from a, from a sequential execution to a parallel execution approach, right? So these three points needs to be looked into the three key aspects needs to be addressed if you want to shift from a from a sequential execution to a parallel execution right so these are the three things that need needs to look into this but when you look into this there is various uh, attributes that needs to be looked into right now depending upon this there are various attributes attributes that needs to be addressed that needs to be addressed right so they have listed few attributes wherein this attributes needs to be addressed and it is going to be addressed by any one of this right the first thing that they look is the level of parallelism level of parallelism or simply i am going to call it as the computational granularity computational granularity computational granularity is the first aspect that needs to be looked into the second one they talk about time and space complexity time and space complexity because you might have heard this word now in advanced uh, algorithms wherein this word time complexity and space complexity needs to be computed to know the efficiency of an algorithm this you would know what it means time and space complexity the third one is they need to look into the interprocess communication but the latency that has been defined has to be as minimal as possible so your communication system should address latency communication latency needs to be addressed the communication latency once when you have through with the communication latency then comes then comes the scheduling process scheduling policies in what way you are going to define the scheduling policies comes into picture once the scheduling policies are defined the last one very important one again it is about load balancing right now these are the key attributes that needs to be looked into when you want to exploit a parallelism and a, a, any method that you propose should always look into all these attributes the first one is looking at the first one the level of parallelism here i'm going to call it as computational granularity right now the word granularity refers to the smallest unit right in, in case of a in case of a program if i want it to be split into parallel execution now what is the level that i look into for example you have a program of say 100 codes 100 lines of uh, 100 li 100 instructions right now if i want to look into partitioning of that program now if there is no dependency if there is no dependency all the 100 lines can be executed concurrently 
I am repeating the point. If there are no dependency on 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 the execution of hundred instructions, then all the hundred instructions can be executed concurrently. Now at that level, my granularity level is going to be one there. In one go, I am able to execute all hundred instructions, right? But again, assume the same program with hundred instructions, wherein there is a dependency. For example, thirty lines are. Uh, independent the remaining 70 lines are dependent on the outcome of the previous one then i cannot execute all concurrently because i even though the instruction is ready it needs to wait till it gets a output from the previous instruction right so likewise your granularity level or the level of parallelism is going to be the smallest set of instructions that can be computed together so sometimes it could be a small module it could be a macro it could be a small module or it could be a subroutine or it could be a procedure or it could be a part of a program or even a, a, the entire program could be one part right likewise what is the smallest unit that is possible for it to be executed parallelly is what we call it as a computational granularity again there are various levels it could be fine granularity or it could be medium or it could be coarse depending upon the way you define it is going to be right and there are no standard methods of defining this granularity right if you want to define the granularity the only thing that you need to make out is make sure that they are less dependent on the resources right they are less dependent on the resources then you can then you can make them to execute concurrently right now this is what right now looking at the time and space complexity this is with respect to because we look into the performance somewhere the time and space complexity needs to be looked into <coughs> the third one very important one communication latency latency is simply the delay or i would say the patience level of a user the maximum maximum of acceptance of any system depends upon its response time and the response time again depends upon its active time right so that is where this latency comes into picture the delay that is being induced because of or it's involved in the communication process has to be as little as possible or as minimal as possible so we you need to come out with the mechanism wherein the total delay involved has to be as minimal as possible that is where your communication latency comes into picture right the next one is the scheduling policies the methods that you are using for scheduling needs to be looked into because here i said no multiple processors are working together so somewhere if they are working together the, your job needs to be scheduled properly if a job is not scheduled properly then you cannot exploit parallelism even if you have say 10 processors and but your job is not been properly scheduled to all the processes then probably even having 10 processes may not serve the purpose that is where your scheduling mechanism comes into picture for exploiting the parallelism once when you are using a scheduling mechanism make sure that your scheduling mechanism is fair in nature it is fair in nature so that the load that is being imposed is going to be uniform across every processors right so that is where the concept of load balancing comes into picture so somewhere at the back of your mind when you are designing a designing a parallel programming approach so all this needs to be looked into this attributes needs to be looked into when you want to exploit the parallelism clear right okay then if you are clear with this then we'll go to the next topic the next topic is we are going to look into the dependencies we are going to look into the word dependency right i think many a times i have used this word now dependency i said if there are non dependent if they are independent then only they can be made to execute parallelly right now what is this dependency i'm going to give a small example i assume that i have an array of uh, 100 elements i want to find the sum of all the elements of this array right i want to find the sum of all the elements of an array now when you execute sequentially 
taking one element from an array now assuming that for each addition it takes around one unit of time so probably for 100 units of uh, for 100 elements it takes 100 units of time if it is executed sequentially but i am not happy with the 100 uh, units of time uh, somewhere i want it to be reduced now if i want it to be reduced what is the option available for me now the option available for me is to split the array into two parts and then so my array of 100 elements can be split in from uh, 0 to 49 in the first uh, first array and 14 50 to 99 the second array. i can split it into two arrays and then add perform the addition here i can perform the addition here so this when i perform the addition here i am performing the two additions simultaneously concurrently if that is the case then automatically the time needed for finding the sum is going to be is going to be half of it plus some delta value plus some delta value the total time that it takes is going to be half of it plus some delta value right now this is possible because i made an assumption that all the 100 elements are available in the array right this is possible but assume that the outcome of the array elements depends upon some condition say for example i want uh, the uh, i want uh, say the elements in an array uh, to be dependent on each other for example the second element in an array is going to be the first square root of the first one the third element is going to be the square root of the second element the fourth is going to be the square root of the third element right so likewise if i have a scenario like this now can i apply my same method of dividing my array into two parts and then uh, compute no probably i cannot do it because there is a dependency because the outcome of the previous instruction is needed for executing the next instructions so there i would say it is a data dependent so somewhere your data is hindering or it, your data is hindering for exploiting the parallelism right so this is one scenario assume that you have everything but you have only one processor which can keep which is capable of executing at any given point of time only one instruction it doesn't know or your computing machine doesn't have a capability of executing more than one instruction now if that is the case even though if your data is independent but still i cannot execute uh, because i have only one processor which can do the computation right so there i am going to call it as a resource dependency right so even though i want to exploit the parallelism i want to convert the sequential to a parallel i want to exploit the parallelism available because there is a support in the data but because of the resource constraints the resource constraints i may not be able to exploit right so somewhere i would say that data should be available the abundant resources should be available right e, but if data is available and the resources are available then can i execute uh, the instructions can i execute the instructions again i'm come back to my same example so as i said no the next element is going to be the square root of the previous element right now in this case when do the results are generated the results are going to be generated only during the run time right after you write your program and then when you start to execute at that instant only it starts to generate the results right now if this is the scenario now is it possible for a for your accumulator or for your computer to fetch the data for your uh, processor to fetch the data probably no because it has to complete its execution only after completing its execution the results are going to be generated so somewhere there is a dependency here the dependency is control dependency right or i would say this values are going to be generated only after your program is executed so that is why your control dependency it is dependent on the control of the flow of the instructions right so likewise so there are three dependencies being defined the first one i'm going to call it as a data dependency the second one is control dependency the third one is resource resource dependency right so these are the three things here right 
the data dependency the control dependency and the resource dependency right resource dependency out of all these three which is very easy because we want the data to be executed parallelly if it wants the data to be executed parallelly somewhere a redundant resources needs to be provided now providing a redundant resources is a easy job is a easy job so that is where this resource uh, dependency comes into picture for example i said no if you want uh, alu to be in my example i said no we want uh, the array to be split into two and executed concurrently if i have two alus defined then automatically i can use the two alus right now this resource dependency can be provided but the only factor that hinders this resource dependency is the cost factor involved always remember for exploiting the parallelism always you need to consider the cost always there is a trade off between the amount of enhancement in the performance and the cost that is going to be involved right the amount of performance that is going to be enhanced and the cost that is going to be involved always there is a trade off between this both so they both are going to decide at what level your resources are going to be redundant in nature that is where this resource and dependency is going to come into picture for example i said no if it is a alu then it is going to be alu dependency if it is a storage dependency then it is going to be uh, then if it is a memory requirement then it is going to be a storage dependency likewise depending upon the resources these are the physical resources that are needed so this resource dependency needs to be provided so that you can guarantee you guarantee the concurrent execution right additional resource allocation is what we come across in resource dependency providing resource dependency is very easy is very easy but the only thing that hampers us is the cost involved now as i said no always there is going to be a cost trade off between the cost and the resource that you can provide right now coming to the above one control dependency now as i said no this control dependency is going to come into picture only during run time so this control dependency is going to come into picture only during run time now if that is a scenario if that is a scenario well, how do you provide this because when you are writing a program you don't know what is going to be the behavior of your program because your behavior of your program is going to be exploited only during the run time right to discuss this control dependency your textbook has given a small uh, uh, bit of code let me write that bit of code and then uh, discuss that so here he has written a small program do 20 i equals to 1 comma n and then a of i equals to c of i and then he has put a condition if a of i less than 0 then a of i equals to 1 he has written two programs this is the first one the second one is this program b again do 10 i is equals to 1 to n do 10 i is equals to 1 to n and then he gives a condition if of i minus 1 equals to 0 then he says a of i equals to 1 and then 10 continue here also it is going to be 20 continue i forgot to write this line so this is a small code of program that is given in your textbook to explain the concept of control dependency your uh, textbook has written a small bit of code so i think this is a for photon programming language now do 20i is equals to 1 to n now it they would do 20i 1 to n is nothing but it is a label and then it is a looping instruction do i is equals to 1 to n your loop needs to be repeated n number of times and what is it that you are doing inside the loop you are finding you are here it says a of i is equals to c of i the value of c is going to be transferred to array a based on the index right so c of i is equals to a of i and what is the condition here 
and he gives a condition if a of i less than 0 if a of i is less than 0 then a of i equals to 1 what is the condition if the value that you have read is going to be 0 if your c of i at that instance is 0 now replace it with 1 and then continue right now this looping continues right now as i said now this is one loop wherein it is going to be repeated n number of times now when you come to the second one again do 10 i is equals to 1 to n wherein a loop which is repeated n number of times again what is the condition here if a of i minus 1 equals to 0 if the previous element is equals to 0 a of i minus 1 the previous element because the present iteration is i i minus 1 if the previous element is equals to 0 then what is the condition now he says the present element is also made to be 0 e of i minus 1 equals to 0 the present element is also going to be made to 0 and then continue and then continue right now so it's going to be continued right now what is the difference that you can make out from the first one and the second one are they both one and the same right to a certain extent they are same right but the question is but the question is can i execute my approach here splitting this uh, n elements into two and then execute can i s apply the same one here can i split this into two and uh, and execute to a certain extent yes i can split it into two wherein the RSI is going to be n by 2 and then execute because each iteration is independent and it is not dependent on the previous one but here in every iteration it is dependent on the previous iteration value right now that is why I say this control is independent independent control but whereas this is dependent control right the first one is a independent control but whereas this one is a dependent control now why we want to find out this dependency and independency because if it is a dependent one if it is a dependent one obviously we cannot exploit the parallelism because if because in this scenario it is dependent on the outcome of the previous iteration you cannot execute it concurrently but whereas here here it is independent each iteration is independent because during the runtime you are finding the value and then you are computing right so here it is independent now in this scenario you can exploit parallelism you can look out for mechanisms wherein with the help of your hardware software or a compiler you are able to achieve parallelism right i'm using the word parallelism parallelism can be exploited either by using a hardware approach using a software approach or with the support of a compiler right now in this scenario i think using the support of a compiler and a software we can exploit parallelism and and even if your uh, compiler doesn't e even if your software doesn't supports but if a compiler is smart enough it can it can make you to exploit the parallelism the compilers that are now being designed makes it possible to exploit the parallelism provided there are no dependencies right now this is what he talks about control dependency if it is dependent you cannot if it is independent you can exploit the parallelism so these things we are going to look into dependency and independency control mechanisms even if i want to exploit the parallelism even if i provide two additional uh, alus here processors here but still i cannot because somewhere it is dependent on the previous one i cannot exploit a parallelism parallelism here but i can exploit a parallelism at this instant clear with this right now coming to the first one data dependency because i have gone in the reverse order because it, it becomes easy for us to understand right now again data dependency now the question is 
how do you define a data dependency dependency how do you find a data dependency in what way you're going to find a data dependency right now if you are able to find the data dependency then obviously obviously you can make out whether you can exploit parallelism or not right the data dependency if you are able to find out the data dependency then obviously you can exploit the parallelism if there is a data dependency you cannot if the data dependency is not present it can be exploited right now to exploit uh, the data dependency we use a we use a data dependency graph we use a concept called as use a concept called as dependency graph a dependency graph in this dependency graph the nodes are going to be represented when i say a graph is nothing but it is a combination of nodes and edges the nodes are going to be the statements of a program the statements of a program and the edges are going to be the relations right the instructions that are going the uh, the edges are going to be the relations that exist between the between the instructions using this edges and nodes representation we are going to draw a dependency graph when we look into the dependency graph then we can make out whether we can exploit parallelism or not right wherein if there is no dependency obviously those instructions could be could be could be executed parallelly if there is a dependency you need to wait till you get the result and then execute the graph right so like this for this we have got around five dependencies being defined the five dependencies the first one they call it as flow dependency flow dependency the second one they call it as anti dependency a n t i flow dependency the anti dependency the third one they are going to call it as output output dependency the third one they are going to call it as output dependency the fourth one they are going to call it as input output dependency and the fifth one they are going to call it as unknown dependencies unknown right the five dependencies are being defined the first one is a flow dependency the second one is anti dependency the third one is output dependency the fourth one is io dependency and the fifth one is a unknown dependency right now again to make you understand this uh, dependencies before i get into the definitions of this uh, and what it represents and how it represents let me take up a small program again the, uh, again your textbook has got a small piece of uh, code using that code we will understand the code and then try to re relate into any one of this clear you got the approach i am going to write the small program that is given in your textbook and we'll try to look into which instructions can be executed and based on the instruction execution we are going to define to which dependency it belongs to clear right so this is again a small set of uh, program with five instructions so s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 five instructions the first one is load r1 comma a the second instruction is add r2 r 1 right the second instruction load r 2 the third one is move r 1 comma r 3 move r 1 comma r 3 s 4 there are only four instructions here s 4 is store b comma r 1 right four sets of instructions right looking at the program i think uh, you might uh, remember your uh, microprocessor uh, lab wherein you would have written uh, you would have come across this instructions load add move store load a comma b what does it means 
load the contents of B into A. Add A comma B. What does it mean? Add the A and B and put the value in B. Right? So similarly, the first instruction S1 is going to be load A R1 comma A. Load the contents of accumulator into register R1. Right? Now, for executing this, do I need to look into any other or do I need to depend on any other? No, I don't need to depend on any other, right? The second one, L add, what is the second instruction? Add R, R2, comma R1. Now, what is the outcome of this instruction? I need to, this instruction is simply, I need to find the sum of the contents of register R1, R2 and put it in the register R2. I need to find the sum of register R1, R2 and put it into the put it into the register R2. Now if I want to execute this instruction, can I execute it independently or should I dependent on or should I wait for some other instruction to be executed here? The same question I am going to repeat for the S1 here. Can I execute this instruction or should I wait for some other instruction to be executed here this instruction can be executed independently because it is simply moving the contents of accumulator to r1 but whereas here again it is simple add instruction add the contents of r1 to r2 and push the results to r2 but if i want to execute this i need a value of r2 which is available in the register i need the value of r1 but where do i get the value of r1 i r1 value i'm going to derive only only after completion of the previous instruction what is the previous instruction it has to load the contents of accumulator into r1 only after completion of this instruction only after completion of this instruction i am able to execute this instruction right you're getting the point here S1 can be executed. If I want the S2 to be executed, the obviously the S1 should be should be executed first, right? So then I would say that the second instruction somewhere is dependent on the previous instruction. So then I'm going to say that it is flow dependent, right? I'm using the word flow dependent here. If you want to execute the instruction S2, it is dependent on the flow of S1 because it exists in a path of it, it exists in a sequence and if it wants to execute this it is going to be dependent on this so s1 and s2 i say they are flow dependent right i would simply say s2 is flow dependent on s1 so i'm going to say that s2 is s2 is flow dependent on s1 right so without the completion of s1 s2 cannot be executed right similarly when i come to the s3 when i come to the s3 move r1 comma r3 so move the contents of r3 to r1 move the contents of r3 to r1 now for executing this uh, s3 do i need to dependent on s1 and s2 then obviously no you don't need to dependent on any one right now if that is the case now what is the relation that you can make out between s1 and s3 the relation between s1 and s2 is flow dependent but what is the relation that you can make out from s1 and s so simply i would say the relation between uh, s3 and s1 is s3 is output dependent on s1 so s3 is output dependent on s1 right now again s4 now what is the relation between uh, s3 and s4 if i want to execute the s4 if i want to execute s4 then what should be the mechanism that uh, what should uh, what should if i want to execute s4 what should be the outcome i should need the outcome of s3 because i need to move the contents from r3 to r1 only after execution of r3 uh, sorry s3 then only s4 can be executed now what can be the relation between s3 and s4 now what is the relation between s3 and s4 simply i would say s3 and s4 are what type whether it is flow dependent or output dependent it is flow dependent because s3 s4 the flow is needed here so s3 and s4 are flow dependent s3 
एस फोर इज फ्लो डिपेंडेंट ऑन एस थ्री हियर एस फ्लो एस फोर इज फ्लो डिपेंडेंट ऑन एस थ्री सो एस फोर इज फ्लो डिपेंडेंट ऑन एस वन राइट नाउ लेट इज लुक इन टू द रिलेशन बिटवीन एस टू एंड एस थ्री इज एर एनी रिलेशन दैट एग्जिस्ट बिटवीन एस टू एंड एस थ्री नाउ कैन आई इंटरचेंज द एग्जीक्यूशन ऑफ एस थ्री एंड एस टू कैन एग्जीक्यूट दिस फर्स्ट एंड देन एग्जीक्यूट दिस लेटर is it possible do i get any change in the results if i interchange the execution sequence of s3 and s2 then probably no i don't get any difference in the results because both are independent now simply i would say anti dependent on s2 so the relation between s3 and s2 is s3 is anti dependent on s2 because for executing this I don't need any outcome of S two, or even uh, even if I interchange, it it is not going to make any difference in the outcome here. It it is not going to make any difference in the behavior. So simply, I would say the relation between S two and S three is simply anti dependence. So there is no relation that exists for executing during the flow of the program. That is why I would say S three and S two are anti dependent. Right. Now again, coming to the S two instruction, S two instruction is simply add instruction is a combination of two instructions, add and then store. Because when I use the word uh, uh, add R one and R two, then it is going to be simply R one plus R two, and then I'm going to move that to R two. So this addition is two things. find the sum and then move the contents to the register r through here right now if that is a scenario now what is the relation between the s2 and itself because if s2 instruction needs to be completed again it has got two inbuilt instructions into it first is perform addition and the second is move the results into the register r2 if that is a scenario then i would simply say the relation of s2 e on itself is going to be flow dependent because it needs to find the addition and then move to the register r2 so simply i would say s2 is going to be a flow dependent on itself right so likewise you can make out and is there any relation between s1 and s3 yes they are output dependent is there a, a, s1 and s2 is flow dependent s1 and s4 is there anything here again s1 and s4 is flow dependent right similarly when i look into the relation between s2 and s3 yes it is is there any relation between s2 and s3 no relation anti dependent now s2 and s4 is there any relation between s2 and s4 there is no relation between s2 and s4 again it is not at all into consideration right because s2 and s4 no relation now coming to the 3 and 4 What is the relation between three and four? It is output dependent, right? Three and four is again, sorry, three and four is again a flow dependent. Likewise, looking into the nature of the dependency, it could be either a flow dependent, it could be anti dependent, it could be output dependent or I O dependency. These three are with respect to execution, but whereas this I O dependency always occurs either during read or write operation the io dependency is always with respect to read or write operation right so likewise this five dependencies are going to be used right no in the next one we are going to look into the definition of the flow dependency we are going to look into the definition of anti dependency output dependency input dependency and then unknown dependency right no for this i'm going to add a slide look into the slide that gives you the definition of all this flow dependency anti dependency output dependency io dependency and unknown dependency so the definition goes like this the first one the flow dependency the first one flow dependency a statement s2 is flow dependent on statement s1 if an execution path exists from s2 to s1 if an execution path exists from s2 to s1 and if at least one output of s2 is fed as an input at least one output 
of S1 is fed as an input. This we are going to call it as a flow control. So, in this there is a relation between S1 and S2. S1 is flow dependent on S2. Right. Second one, anti-dependence. Statement S2 is anti-dependent on statement 1 if, if S2 follows S1 in a program order. If S1 if S2 follows S1 in a program order and the output of S2 overlaps the input of S1. Overlaps the input of S1. So the two statements S1 and S3 are going to be called as anti-dependence if there is a overlap in the operation of S2 before the S1. I said no. In my example S2, S3 can be interchanged. So they are anti-dependent, right? Now the third one, output dependency. Two statements are output dependent if they produce the same output variable. Output dependency if they produce the same variable, right? The fourth one, I/O dependency. The two operations read and write are I/O statements, and this I/O dependency occurs not because of some variables involved but because of the same files that are being referred by both input and output statements right so this is with this io dependency is concerned with with the read or write operation wherein if you are performing a read or write operation with the same file then at that instance you would encounter this io dependency and the last one unknown dependency the dependency relation between the two statements cannot be determined a proper definition of this cannot be determined but are uh, but under certain conditions like this the subscript of a variable is itself subscript or a subscript doesn't contains the loop index variable he has given few following conditions the third condition he says is a variable appears more than once with subscripts having different coefficients of the loop variable or if the subscript is non-linear in a loop index variable so somewhere all this is con is being discussed wherein you are going to encounter this condition during a runtime because the subscript values depends upon uh, or it, it changes and depends only during the runtime at that instant you are going to use this scenarios clear right So I think you are clear with the definitions and now they are using a representation. The representation is if it is a flow dependency, they are going to use a arrow, a arrow, a pointed arrow. Right? The representation of uh, flow dependency is with respect to a, a arrow, right? Now if I say S1 is a de flow dependent, if I write S1 like this, I would simply say S2 is flow dependent on S1. Right? For anti-dependency, I am going to use the word like this, a arrow with a small dash like this. A arrow with a small dash. S1 followed by this form, for, followed by this symbol and then S2 is nothing but, I would say S2 is anti-dependent on S1. For output dependency, again I am using the same arrow with a small circle here. I would depend say simply a read or write operation again it's going to be a arrow mark provided it is with respect to a read and write operation for unknown uh, dependencies because they are not defined you don't find a symbol for representing the unknown dependency right now these are the three symbols that we use a arrow mark arrow with a small dash and arrow with a small circle on it Right? So, these are the three symbols that we are going to use to represent a dependency. Using these symbols, we are going to draw a dependency graph. Right? Now, for the same program, let me draw a dependency graph and then try to come to some conclusion. Let me draw a small graph and then come to a conclusion. So let me draw a dependency graph uh, for this. It's going to be S1, S2, S3, and then 
S4 for instructions, right? Now, is there any dependency between S1 and S2? Because there is a flow dependency in S1 and S2, right? Is there any relation between S1 and S3? As we said, no, S1 and S3 is output dependent. S1 and S3 is output dependent. What about relation S1 and S4? S1 and S4, again it is flow dependent. Right? It is clear with this? Right. Now coming to the S2. Is there any relation between S2 and S3? Is there any relation between S2 and S3? S2 and S3 are antidependent. Right? S2 and S3 are antidependent. Is there any relation between uh, S2 and S4? S2 and S4? No relation. Now coming to the S3 and S4. Is there any relation between S3 and S4? Again S3 and S4 are flow dependent. Right? S3, S4 are flow dependent. I am going to represent it with an arrow. But what about uh, the second one? Again as I said no. It has got a flow dependency with itself. Because it has to find the sum of R1, R2 and then push the value into R2. So there again you see a flow dependency s2 is flow dependent on itself right now this is how you are going to draw a dependency graph by looking at this dependency graph you can you can come out with a mechanism wherein you can choose all the ones that are not dependent anti-dependent here this can be executed at any point of time anti-dependent because it is not dependent on the outcome of the previous one or are any other instructions so i can exploit a parallelism here but if there is a flow dependency then obviously i cannot because i need to wait for completion of a the one right so likewise by using this dependency graph you are able to you are able to make out how you can determine the data dependency once you are able to determine the data dependency automatically you can execute the remaining instructions without without waiting for the outcome to be executed concurrently or parallelly right now this is what we are going to learn in detail for a data dependency graph right so we'll take one more example and then we'll derive a data depend uh, dependency graph for that so once when we derive a dependency graph for this automatically your understanding is going to be much more better now right so th with this we have defined five different five types of dependencies the first one is flow dependency wherein it depends upon the previous one the second one is attendee dependency anti-dependency the third one is output dependency output dependency is it waits or somewhere it needs to be halted till it gets an output right the fourth one is io dependency wherein it occurs with the read write with reference to a memory or a file and the last one is unknown dependencies like this the five dependencies the representation a small example and we are able to draw a dependency graph for the given code segment which contains four instructions s1 s2 s3 and s4 right so with this i'm going to end my class so in the next class we will take up one more example we will take up one more example draw the dependency graph and then look into way in which we can exploit the parallelism clear with this so with this i'm going to end my lecture thank you for your patience listening